<laughs> Thank you. So, Hi, friends in Bangalore. <laughs> So we're going to just get right into it. And hopefully, um, all of you in Bangalore, anyone watching this, um, I hope you can send us questions and, and, and possibly the, the Bangalore Lit Fest team can put them into the chat so we can see them. But um, let's just get straight into it, B. What was it that really drove you um, to, you know, embark on this journey? And, and you were, you know, it's also in the back. You had a toddler. Will was a toddler back then. You had a toddler with you. You decided to retrace some of the steps that one of your heroes, the icon Mary Wollstonecraft, um, you know, the, her journey was phenomenal. So take us through a little bit about what drove you to do it. It's true. It was her journey was extraordinary. So she was a, a really pioneering and kind of groundbreaking woman who sort of came from the, the, the wrong side of the tracks and yet rose self-taught to become one of the bright lights of, of, of the enlightenment, of the, of the political movement that founded human rights in Western thought and therefore feminism. Um, she also had a sort of side gig in amazing adventures in her love life and in her personal life and traveled extensively on her own. And it was in a sort of particular point in my own life when um, having small kids and feeling somewhat kind of that my horizons had pushed inwards on me that I looked again at her life and thought, how did she do that? How did she travel and write and engage politically um, at a time, it, you know, we're talking about the 1790s. So over 200 years ago, when most men didn't travel on their own. So what an extraordinary thing. And, and it's sort of, I caught this bug of uh, obsession with her life and decided to retrace a journey that she made. And so attempts in, in writing about her life to sort of also lower the bar to entry because, and this, this sort of throws forward, if you like, to our question around feminist heroes from history. If people don't know about them, then yeah. what's the point? So I wanted to sort of reclaim her from academia, from, from you know, the feminist biographies that have been written about her and do it in a very accessible way. So it was a kind of chirpy travelogue, sort of journalism style exploration of her life and her legacy. And, you know, I think it's really, it's, uh, it's really interesting. You do it really well. It's very conversational. It's very accessible. Um, oh, we can see some of you in the in, in Bangalore. Hi, guys. Thank you for wearing your mask Hi. and for showing up. Great to see you. Lovely I wish we could have. It's nice and sunny. <laughs> wish we yeah, wish we could have been wish there. Could be there. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you have had a chance to read the book, but I think, you know, Bee's background as a journalist, as much as a feminist, really is the core of this, as well as being a mother, a writer, and all of the other um, hyphenate identities she has. Um, B, let's talk about Mary Wollstonecraft a little bit. You've, you've spoken about her so eloquently in the book, outside the book. She was a firebrand. She was a revolutionary. She might have been the first feminist writer we know of, um, at, at least in the, in the English language. But many of these things have been overlooked. Um, you told me earlier, I mean, she's also the mother of Mary Shelley, which is incredible. I didn't know that. Um, so, so the grandmother of Frankenstein, I guess. Um, and many things have been overlooked in the in the interest people were paying to her life. She was an unconventional woman for her time. Um, many people didn't pay attention to what she was actually setting out to achieve. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about her? Yes. And what's important to note is that she wasn't just overlooked. So some people gain fame and reputation and then they just kind of quietly fritter away and gather layers of dust. This is not the case with Mary Wollstonecraft. She acquired huge celebrity. She was, a, a, you know, an international feminist celebrity when she wrote her much noted A Vindication of the Rights of Woman in 1792, around the time of the French Revolution. And so all the, you know, the, 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 the hot on the heels of the American Revolution, it was a time of uh, societal turmoil and she captured this and wrote not only about women's rights but about you know further right human rights she set it in that landscape because of course you know there was slavery there were many forms of exclusion most men couldn't vote as well as as well as women so all, all sorts of arguments around that um, and this this was the the sphere that she was writing in but the point I wanted to make was that she wasn't just forgotten about, she was annihilated. She died, and this is the sort of horrible part of her story. She was this great pioneer, a brilliant and actually quite funny, but very daring political writer. Um, and, and she also walked the walk. So she had a boyfriend, you know, she had a child out of wedlock. She also had um, suffered from acute mental health problems, attempted on two occasions to take her own life. And it was when she died early at the age of 38, no age, died giving birth to Mary Shelley, um, that her grief stricken husband, the anarchist writer, William Godwin, wrote the first biography of Mary Wollstonecraft. And he disclosed these, these facts about her life. 
And at the time, it was deemed so shocking and so disgusting and despicable that a torrent of abuse landed posthumously on her and her reputation to the extent that, you know, poems about her naked body were still being circulated for years. So it didn't just blow over in a couple of weeks. Um, it was like a really sort of entrenched uh, Twitter storm, if you like, but one that just <laughs> kept going, kept going, kept going. You know, so we, we've all seen trolling, right? We know how it works. What happened was effectively um, her, her legacy became an embarrassment and a, and a sign of, you know, the fallen woman. This is what happens. This is what you get. Women, you know, watch and learn. And particularly in the Victorian era, where women weren't even allowed to have ankles, never mind an education. So she was held up as an object of, of ridicule and disgust. And it's that part of the sort of the, the active misogynist annihilation of her of her life and her legacy that really sparked me onwards to thinking, no, we should we we, we should know about her, we should know what she did, um, and, and continue to have that, you know, engage and have those conversations around her white writing and the things that she cared about. And the things that she stood for, I mean, I think um, I'm, I'm going to ask you definitely a little bit more about, you know, why is this relevant today? Be, you've lived in India, you're an Indophile. For those of you in the audience who don't know this passionate um, Indophile, you've lived here for many years. Um, I do want to ask you a little bit about why feminism is relevant. But, you know, in this this aspect that kind of went off the page, right, like you, you recreated her journey. You also led a, an almost decade long struggle, like to raise funds to, in, to ensure that there's a statue in her honor. Um, in England, <laughs> I know that yes. ran into some controversy. It, I don't think it really, uh, I don't think everyone heard about that movement, but tell us a little bit about why you thought it was important to have, uh, you know, an actual memorial to her and, and, and what, that, what that symbolized for you. Yeah. This is it, you know, it's, it's all part of reclaiming feminist history and reclaiming the, those voices that have been marginalized traditionally, that it wasn't only powerful white men that, that did the great things of history. And there are numerous ways into that. It's not just books, obviously books is the obvious way to, to dig backwards and to, and to discover those voices, but, but it's also about who's celebrated on our streets. I mean, if you look around, say, New Delhi and the, or, or all of the cities and do the renaming of, of street names, for example, is a, is a controversial point in question um, and the same goes for statues and statues memorials the way that we sort of try to influence the public perception um, and that's become a really hot topic over the last couple of years but I spent the previous decade campaigning for a memorial for a, um, a, a work of public art to celebrate the life of Mary Wollstonecraft and in the end a, a rather controversial artist was selected called Maggie Hambling and she chose to memorialize Mary Wollstonecraft in a very original way so it it wasn't a traditional statue of a lady in a bonnet <laughs> holding a book. It was something quite different. And it caused a humongous storm. The headlines went, went, went around the world and we got massively trolled for it. But at the end of it, you know, it was my mum that pointed out, well, you know, everybody in the world is talking about Mary Wollstonecraft now. It certainly felt like they were. <laughs> um, but, it's, you know, it taps into really interesting questions, I think, around the movement, um, very much um, sparked by uh, Black Lives Matter, to scrutinise who is held up aloft as the heroes of our history? Does that stand up to scrutiny? You know, what, what, what is the, the legacy of these people? Who are the other people that should be celebrated? And I think there's fascinating ongoing questions around that. So that became very live and very topical. Yeah, and mirroring, it's really interesting because it, I mean, <laughs> mirroring the controversy that swirled around her life, missing the message of her work, you know, it's, it's kind of like you guys had to deal with that uh, in a big way. Um, just to let the folks know, we definitely want to take some of your questions uh, live, maybe in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, we'll open up for, for live questions if you want to start thinking about those. Um, you can also tag B on Twitter, B Rowlett, and uh, you can tag me, Amrita T, just in case we see them there first. But, you know, we're talking about heroes, who gets to decide who are our heroes, B, who gets to decide who we, you know, put on a pedestal. And obviously, there's so many dangers inherent in that. But today, <laughs> at the end of 2021 at the end of times that we're sitting in. Um, who are your heroes? Who are some of the feminist heroes you think, you know, if you, if you wish that, you know, coming generations or, or even our generation that people should know um, and people who really shaped your writing and your worldview, who would that be? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a bit naughty with that question and kind of not answer it properly because one of the things that I learned from the whole statues debate was um, the, 
the problematic ideologies around elevating any one individual on a pedestal. And as a writer, and I'm sure you feel the same way, um, one of the things that keeps you going in your writing is, is other writers. And I've been so lucky to count on an extended sort of sisterhood of other writers or people that I've enlisted in my mind as sisters who aren't, I've never met them, but they're fellow <laughs> writers whose work inspires and informs me. So it's not just necessarily about picking one great writer who's an icon of feminist endeavor, rather the sense of people around the world connecting to ideas in a way that sort of helps your own ideas to flourish and makes you just feel a little, you know, a little supported at times. Um, yeah. That was a, 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 a bit of a wriggle out of your question. If I had to pick one, I mean, I was really enchanted by the, the short story, um, Sultana's Dream by Begum Rokeya, the great Bengali educator and writer. I think she published that in 1905 in something called the Indian Ladies Magazine, which sounds very, uh, you know, dainty and uh, polite, but actually it's this extraordinary vision of a future with no, well, the women are, are in control. Yeah. The men are, are subordinate, you know, they're, they're kept um, locked away in Purda. They're not allowed to, to really go anywhere or do anything. But also not only, so the, the women live in this feminist utopia, which is also a sort of environmentalist utopia. Mm. And I think that's fascinating in that it completely anticipates one of the literary genres that we're seeing now around eco-criticism and decentering the human from our literature. So she was a bit of a genius and definitely <laughs> worth another look. And incidentally, is there a statue of her? I don't know. I don't know. That's a good point. That's a good question. <laughs> I think that is one to think about. Um, you know, I, it's it's a good way to wriggle out of that question because I think there are so many things um, that are inherent in the structure of like what we what we learn, what we're taught. Uh, whereas I think we all have to construct these for ourselves. You know, like I mean, we're, it's so easy for us. I think, especially in India, to forget like you know we stand on the shoulder of giants, right? Like our grandmothers, our mothers, our great grandmothers, like who fought um, some of them just to just to ensure that we are where we are. And I want to ask you that because you've traveled widely, you've lived uh, you've lived here for so many years, um, and in, in many other countries as well. What do you think really is the relevance of feminism today? Because one of the questions I find really disconcerting is when folks just turn around and be like, I'm obviously not a feminist. I don't believe in feminism. Feminism is anti-men. Um, what, what are some of your thoughts around that? I just crumple inside when I hear that. Um, you don't have to look very far to see how necessary feminism is. Um, but, you know, to a certain extent, I am also guilty of having the same thinking. So I guess I personally have had two kind of, uh, um, I'm not going to say enlightenment, but two kind of waves of consciousness raising, if you like. The first was where um, becoming a mother and suddenly being, you know, knocked out of my own uh, relationship with myself. And suddenly, you know, the old career takes a hit, the wages take a hit, all of that. You just end up being a carer. Not that I minded, but I kind of minded as well as not minding if I can... I hope that makes sense to somebody. Um, but the other thing, of course, is is being being able to travel and live in other cultures. Um, and it was actually, in fact, before I moved to India, two of my close friends, one's Pakistani and one's Bangladeshi, uh, and I was kind of on my. But feminism, really, you know, do we have to do we have to be so statementy? And they were like, "Are you are you kidding? Are you actually kidding?" look around the world if you look around the world it's harder for women I mean, it just is and the fact that it might be okay for you personally is all very nice but that's frankly not good enough and if there's one thing we've learned from being you know from the last couple of pretty awful years let's face it is that and it's interesting this is an analogy that we can take from the pandemic from the coronavirus into politics if everybody's if 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 everybody's not safe if if everybody's not safe, hang on, I've got it wrong. Wait, it's, um, nobody's safe. Yeah, if, protected, yeah. Nobody's yeah. protected. Yes. Yeah, so if some countries have got, you know, a really great vaccine rollout and others haven't, it will it, it will come back and infect you. And, and that applies to the pandemic and to sexism and inequality and oppression. So it's, it's absolutely not acceptable to be comfortable in your own surroundings whilst, you know, and looking at, say, what's happening to reproductive rights in the US. These things go backwards as well as forwards. And, and you just you just can't sleep on the job. Um, so I just I mean, anybody yeah. that's and also I'm really fascinated. And I don't know how you've observed it, Amrita, but, you know, if you, if you sort of try and step back and see these things as waves, you know, that the first wave was 
was trying to prove, certainly in Western thought, that, that, that women were human beings. That was Mary Wollstonecraft's way, right? So she was starting from, uh, we're not property, I'm not a sack of oats um, or an armchair. I'm a, I'm a human being. I also get a vo- vo- voice. That was the first wave. The second wave was around, you know, labor rights, reproductive rights. And so entering the third wave and think, thinking about how we're working now has to be around um, not just women, but marginalized women, yeah. um, you know, either by caste, by the color of your skin, by disabilities. There's any number of, you know, or, or different genders, non-binary people. And and the idea that that it's all fine now and that all those battles have been won is patently not true. It's just so obviously not true. Yeah stop for breath there and uh, what do you think <laughs> I completely agree especially this point about the the sort of need for intersectional feminism the need for us to evaluate all of these uh, you know uh, intersecting and yeah, sort of the hierarchies that we have to kind of dismantle I think part of the challenge B is that you you, this, none of this is taught to you right in school or university unless you choose to uh, you know in school even Whereas you would, you know, kids grow up thinking that everyone's equal. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, you know, you're in the workforce and it's it's okay that, you know, my female colleagues are getting paid a little bit. Obviously I'm better. Like I think this, <laughs> this kind of this kind of divide comes in. And I've been hearing so much about imposter syndrome. I've been hearing about like, you know, a lot of the um, the working folks, right? Where they're like, when it comes to recruitment, sort of the, 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 the traditional divide is that the men will go in super overconfident the women who are actually qualified will be like actually no I don't meet meet each one of those um, criteria so I think it does I mean it trickles into so many things and in India of course I don't have to tell you I mean starting from birth right are are girl children allowed to be born in the first place so I think we have a long way to go I think partly what I love about your book is that it takes it away from this kind of dusty academic conversations that are you know perhaps relegated to um, like you said academia or you know libraries um and, and brings it straight into our lives, you know, like what this woman st- stood for, what you chose to do in kind of recreating a journey. And, you, and there's so many things you learned along the way as well. If you want to share, uh, if you want to share one or two, and then we'll kind of segue into. I think you just hit on such an important point, though, which is and I hadn't really ever thought of this, that you only meet feminism either if if you're going to study it, if you're going to study it, you're kind of already there, aren't you? So it's sort of self-filtering. So then you only meet it when you really need it, when suddenly things all go wrong and you're like, and that only happens when it happens to you. So, you know, and that was one of my beefs with with the Me Too movement. It's like, me, 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 but what about me? Yeah, this happened to me. It needed a a her to, her to, what about her? I might be fine, but, you know, sort of opening out and a constant widening of the the umbrella that we call feminism, um, which sits very clearly within human rights. Women's rights are human rights. That's that's, that's the bottom line. Yeah. And and it's and it's people's it's people's journey to that that I find absolutely fascinating. So I'm always really interested when people that you don't expect to be a feminist are a feminist because you know, for example, you know, I've, I've, um, one of my colleagues at work is an older, very establishment, very sort of posh old man who, with the beating heart of a radical feminist, and I, I find that so impressive because, <laughs> you know, if, if you haven't had those channels to, by which the normal roots, um, and I guess, yeah, if, you know, I bounced in on your question there, but that, that was why I wanted to write something that was perhaps almost even feminism by stealth, you know, that yeah, people wouldn't yeah. go, oh, oh, I'm not sure I like the look of this, you know, that they might be sort of lured <laughs> in by this gripping story. <laughs> you you, you uh, have my vote for <laughs> guerrilla, guerrilla warfare for feminism. I think, B, you have my vote for sure. Exactly. And I think many of your readers. Um, <laughs> no, we should, uh, we are at the, we're virtually at a literature festival. Um, one question to you before we'd love to open up to the audience, if you guys can, um, you know, We'll figure. I can't. We can't see you right now, but we'll figure out a way to get your questions to be. Um, let's talk about writing, B. And you know the way you put this was: who would be mad enough to write books? Who indeed, B? <laughs> what is the deal with writing? It's 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 solitary. It's difficult. It takes like it takes everything to come out with a book, and then you know you have the whole naysayers who like no one reads anymore. Um, what's the deal? I think. <sighs> Yeah, it's 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 a it's a love hate love it's pri- primarily love, but with a you know a shred of of suffering. The act of writing. I mean, we're talking to an audience of people who love books. That's why you're at the festival. Um, but uh, a lot of people who come to festivals are also re- you know writers. People are, I know lots of people who um, show up. I can't see the audience, but I wish I could. Um, please do put your questions in. Uh, please indicate to uh, whoever's there that you want to ask us questions if you have questions. Um, but Yes, 
that I think the the relationship between reading and writing is very very close. So one of the things that we're, I'm often asked, and I'm sure you have been too, Amrita, um, and let's not forget your amazing novels and and you know the the work that you put in. I'm, I'm sort of veering around in my answers here, but part of the pain of writing isn't just like your, your spinal disfigurement and the loneliness, but your own self that you put into your writing. And I, I know you've done that too, Amrita, in your in your novels. Um, and it's and and that makes it a very very personal and poignant experience. Um, perhaps not. That's not the case for people who write, um, you know, his, you know, very dry history, historical accounts, or you know, something that's completely separate. Um, perhaps fiction. But even then, you know, th there's so much of yourself that goes into it. Uh, I've written a couple of nonfiction. I'm currently experimenting unsuccessfully with the realm of fiction <laughs> I mean, you've got more experience in that than me Amrita and it's 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 I think it's harder I think writing fiction is harder than non-fiction because you don't have those comforting boundaries and walls of facts um you just go whoa, whoa, everything's a jelly I pushed it and it's moved away it's really really very difficult um and you don't know when you've finished and I can just complain for a long time I don't want to take up too much of our precious 30 minutes but you know but it's your experience yeah you know I think it's I found it um I love writing and I've always like I, I, I found it really difficult to write fiction and then I've worked on three non-fiction books uh, in the mental health space and I found there actually um it, it wasn't easier but it was a different kind of hard you know but I definitely found it easier to talk about those books I think you're so right about novels being like so personal that you kind of feel a little bit like bashful even you know like writers are kind of like you know in a corner being like oh well you know I'm so glad you liked it <laughs> but really won't get into the process with the non-fiction you can really stand behind like this was an interview this was these are the facts and this was the so um but I did read a really I mean I don't remember who said this but someone said they go to they go to novels uh, for the truth, you know, and it, nonfiction is like really our sort of eliding that those, those kind of boundaries. So um, we have a lot. We have a lot to, <laughs> I think, pass that through. That about bashfulness. You just talked about feeling bashful. That feeds back into the whole imposter syndrome thing that you yeah. raised before. You know, I'm sure not all writers feel bashful talking about their work. This is true. You know, and yeah. I, for one, I absolutely had to train myself to be able to stand up and go, yeah, 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 and feel confident <laughs> and on. And this is my product. And I guess it does help if it's nonfiction because then there's a there's a, an external entity, there's a thing that you're referring yeah. to. It's easier to project confidently yeah. around that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's a hard, that's a skill. That's kind of like a muscle that you have to train. Yeah. And it feeds yeah. back into that, how we're, how we're raised and conditioned, um, you know, not to show off, basically. Yeah, yeah. But nothing beats writing. I mean, whoever, like, you know, the, we could see a short while ago, a few of you in the audience. I know many, many, many readers love writing and vice versa. And we love readers and writers, speaking for both me and myself. And nothing beats it. Oh, yes. You know, it's, it's tough, but nothing nothing beats the process and what, what you come up with at the end. Um, could we check in to see if anyone has any questions? Uh, I don't know if you guys have a mic there. If you can, do you want to come to the mic and then maybe have a, you know, say who you are and ask a question? We've lost, we have we've a, lost the view of, um, of our audience, yeah. but we hope you're still there. Otherwise, into the either. I guess it is virtual, so <laughs> it's okay. I guess so. So here I am in London. There you are in New Delhi, yeah. beaming into Bengaluru, wishing I was there. Wow. Yeah. Maybe next year. That's the word on everybody's lips. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. Things aren't great in London right now. Um, I don't know what yeah, it's like over there. <laughs> I hope um, you and your family are staying safe. It's 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 sounding pretty yeah. scary all over. Like we have to yes, be a bit. Um, it's that weird sinking feeling of we recognize it now, uh, you know, with each sort of successive spike, you get that kind of a uh, roller coaster feeling, that kind of like, oh, we're peaking just as far up as it's a slightly I know. horrible, but now and we're familiar watching. feeling. Yeah, and we're watching because we're always like a month or two behind, right? So everyone's like, well, <laughs> those are the warning signs, don't ignore them. Um, we, we have a couple of minutes left. Let's not, like, we, we'll definitely, okay. um, you know, maybe invite anyone who watches this video. You They can tweet at you. Uh, it's your, it's yes. your ad your full name uh, yes. can, and any of your readers I know you're you know always happy to hear from readers um oh, but, you absolutely know, I mean, I, yeah I, responses to you know one of the things I really celebrate that I'm seeing increasingly in publishing I, I work in my day job is I, I work for the British Library and we put on literary events so we're very engaged with you know publishing trends and how things are moving and one of the things I've seen a lot is 
um, an increased interest and appetite for um, marginalised voices and for voices from history that have been overlooked for, for various reasons. Um, and these are the stories, you know, there's endless stories about out there. Uh, it just the human experience is, is infinite and that's so exciting that's so exciting so yeah people um I'm, I'm always delighted to hear from readers who quite often say you know i liked this story and it, and it connects to other parts of their history it's i mean obviously every country has its wollstonecraft every country has its women who have sacrificed um being hung out to dry you know it's it's it's, it's that's a very much a universal experience yeah, and still have them, right? Like this is this is a thing. It's like it's a it's a living it's a living presence. You know, when you're talking about the Victorian era, like we know so much about that, and you know, the, the former colonies know a lot about that, and that kind of uh, staying, um, you know, even centuries later. But um, okay, final words, B. We'll wind down with this one, I guess. Um, your thoughts, hopes for the next generation of writers, um, readers who might be who might be watching this. One hope as we wind down the year. Cool. One hope. I hope that people write more. I hope people find the time and space to write. Finding headspace for writing is really hard, you know, and it's, I mean, it's hard enough to compose a tweet, let alone <laughs> write a book. <laughs> Finding headspace is a really important thing, and particularly if you've got caring responsibilities, day jobs, all the rest of it. Um, I just, you know, if, if I had one hope for people listening to this, it would be that you find space to to nourish that part of yourself, the reading and writing part of yourself. Let's all take advantage of every, every possible opportunity to do that. I love that. And I will just add on to say, like, I hope you, you all find your voice. I hope you find a safe space to express your voice. And um, thank you for being readers. Thank you for believing in, um, you know, the transformative power of stories, because I think that's, that's pretty much all we have. And I hope you all stay safe. Um, we'll say bye here, but hope to see you in person um, soon. Bye, V. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye.